Hello. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Hello. Nice to see you all. I'm Graham, Graham Brooker. I'm the head of program interior design here at the Royal College of Art. Lovely to see you here in the room. Lovely to see the six million people online as well, streaming in. It's not to make you nervous at all in any way. Um, we're going to have a lovely introduction to these two guys sitting in front of us, so I won't go into that. I'd just like to say hello, welcome to the Inside Out series, Inside In, Outside Out series. Um, a little bit of context, this is a series which is formulated, conceived, run, operated by our fantastic interior design students. And uh, to give you a little bit of background on that, many years ago, um, I sort of thought, do you know what? I think these guys have got their finger on the pulse far more than I ever have. So therefore they should invite people in to talk and who do they want to listen to, not to me and so on and so forth. So once handed over, once delegated, these guys have run with it and done a fantastic job. And over the years, it's become bigger, more brilliant, more fantastic than ever. And this year is no exception. So it's these guys here who are the fantastic mm -hmm. people. There is loads of them in the room here who organised this. So I'm really, really chuffed to see this thing fly and really become something spectacular. So, so welcome, a really warm welcome from the programme, from the school, from the institution. And I'm going to hand over to Stephanie, who's going to do a lovely introduction to Vitruvius. Thanks very much. <laughs> Hi everyone, good evening. Um, I'm Stephanie and I am um, an interior design student at the Royal College of Art. I'm part of the Inside Out team this year. And within our team, there are five of us, myself, Evgenia, Phoebe, Alex, and Mauricio. And what we do is we curate and organize bi-weekly lectures with internationally renowned practices to discuss their work. Um, Inside Out is proudly the RCA's only student <clears throat> lecture series. And the aim is to use the conversations in the lectures to enliven and cross-fertilize ideas for many design disciplines. We really hope to differentiate our series from others by shifting the content away from something glossy and polished to more of a discussion platform that confronts the ebbs and flows, glamour, glitz, and grit of being an industry. We encourage designers to talk candidly about their career decisions, pitfalls and all, and our guests are asked to share advice and personal experience about getting started in the field and any valuable lessons learned and share any professional insight. Um, we have a really exciting lineup of speakers planned. A few weeks ago, we had Beata Human, and next week we have Joyce Wang joining from Hong Kong on Zoom on uh, November 23rd, and you're welcome to register for the webinar on the QR code. And to stay up to date with any future events with our series, please follow our, our Instagram at RCA underscore interior design. For tonight, we really emphasize that it's meant to be a, a discussion platform and a conversation. So if you have any questions at all that comes up at the moment, please feel free to raise your hand in the middle and, and, and um, put up your questions. For tonight, we have Adam and Maria from Retruvius. Working with Salvage requires the insight to see the beauty and potential in materials that others might reject or throw away. For over 30 years, Retruvius has led the way in this field, applying their philosophy to the buildings they work with. Less than 1% of demolition materials are reused in the construction industry. Retruvius Studio seeks to elevate the reuse of overlooked materials. They celebrate the tactile personality and emotional quota that reused materials bring and celebrate age as a visceral narrative. From the laying of foundation stones to the cutting of the curtain fabric, they question how they can do things and to understand the potential of reuse from the outset. And their questions are, how can we reuse what we have already and how can we do so and still do it again? And please join me in welcoming Maria and Adam. Thank you. 
Stephanie, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start talking a little bit about the salvage side and then pass over to Maria to talk about the uh, design side of the company. Um, okay. But I might chip in. <laughs> and you guys, seriously, if there's something that comes up, because we don't want to be, it's not about, oh, we know what's best. You know, it's much more if there's something that. Okay, can I start now? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. There are many claims and theories about, <clears throat> about sustainability, um, but surely willfully destroying what we already have has got to be the dumbest course of action. I took this photo of perfectly good hardwood flooring uh, at a shell centre demolition a few months ago. Uh, I asked the demolition guy why it was being destroyed and they just shrugged their shoulders. Salvage is nothing new. Um, it's, uh, it just got forgotten about in our industrialised, mechanised, globalised, commercialised world. Um, it's manual and slow and difficult, um, but it also is immensely rewarding. It, there's a feel-good factor that comes from taking something unloved and making it loved, from taking something unvalued and making it precious, from taking something damaged and repairing it. Uh, there's a story, a narrative that comes with salvage. There's a materiality, uh, often materials that are unavailable or shouldn't be available, new tropical hardwoods or precious marbles. Um, there's texture, there's patina, there's a sense of uh, serendipity when you find the right thing to fit into your project. There's common sense, there's history, and the phrases circular economy and climate crisis, which are very obviously of the moment, but you know, when we started 30 years ago, they weren't phrases that existed, but we just reacted to common sense. Uh, we saw things being destroyed and who's gonna save them? We realized we had to put our hand up. One small def, well, start with the definition. Reuse is obviously reusing something as it exists. Recycling uh, means reprocessing. It's a putting energy into making something. There's a waste hierarchy, reduce, reuse, recycle. Reuse is obviously higher up the waste hierarchy. Why isn't more stuff reused? Um, why are we often talking about recycling? Recycling um, is scalable, it's mechanized, um, it's, uh, there's more money in it. So it tends to get talked about a lot more than reuse. Reuse is um, unglamorous, it's dirty, it's slow, it's uh, logistically difficult, um, it's, it's quite painful. It's quite painful to reuse stuff, it's quite painful to hold it and wait for the right moment to reuse it. You have to have it in your own sort of hand, as it were, to make it available to your clients to, for your, your projects. It's not something you can, I mean, you can nowadays order some bit online, but it's not that easy. These are just a few of the <laughs> photos of, I'm just trying to give you some context about my world. So I was on this site last month and I, just happened to have a passing conversation with another salvage dealer. Um, and he said, oh, I've been on this amazing, you know, you really like this building, it's really cool. It was in uh, Mission Impossible and, uh, you know, using quite a few things. He said, there's loads of teak in it, it's a shame they're trashing it. I was like, oh, come on guys, let's tell me the address, I'll go there. So I saved a bit of teak, but there was, I was too late for most of it. Um, this building lasted, sorry, let me just find a few notes. <laughs> This building going to be demolished? Yeah, total demolition. Um, that building lasted about 50 years. Um, we started in Glasgow. This is Basil Spencer's, the explosive demolition of Basil Spencer's uh, Hutchinson Town uh, block. That lasted about 31 years, I believe. Um, we went in there, we were asked by Charles Brooking. I don't know if any of you guys know the Brooking collection, worth looking up. Um, Charles Brickney asked us to go and save window samples. Um, there wasn't a huge amount of and salvage. Letterboxes. Letterboxes. Yeah, letterboxes. <laughs> um, this was actually the first proper demolition we ever got involved in. When we were writing a business plan, it so happened that our kind of tutor guy for helping the business plan was uh, 
involved in a church that was being redeveloped. The congregation had shrunk. They were going to build a newer small church on the site. Um, classic story. Uh, we find that, you know, building types recur and churches are one of those ones which, you know, are often sadly demolished. Um, can, so, can, I, can we just talk about this, the business plan idea? Because that suddenly sounds very um, uh, uh, grown up. Um, and we, we were only, we had done our part one in architecture and then there was an enormous recession. Um, and so it was a long time ago, sometime in the 80s, 90s, and was it? 90s. Early 90s. Early 90s. Anyway, and it, I, in a way, we were incredibly lucky because we couldn't actually get any jobs. And we didn't particularly want any jobs. And we didn't really want to come back south. We quite liked not having too much involvement by parental control. <laughs> so we started... Um, looking into the idea of wrestling these various elements and worked out that after our part one in architecture that we could actually get funding to start putting together a business plan having no idea what a business plan is because no one does anyone talk to you about business plans not really no exactly <laughs> i mean can i just say we have only ever written one business plan yeah, yeah. so it's yeah but it was, it, didn't, it didn't last very long it didn't last very long but it was incredibly useful because it actually made you be more ambitious for yourself and more ambitious for the idea of what we were doing so our initial thing was oh we can salvage some wonderful old pine shutters that we were pulling out of skips we were like oh great we can make those into well, little storage boxes and a nice little bench and you know quite gentle conservative things financially didn't make sense whatsoever um anyway and that's what we thought we were doing but as adam says we were given access to this church and we were sort of pretty much left to our own devices to just slowly take it apart yeah. and when you you know when we spent three years you know with our rotary pens at that stage mm -hmm. drawing everything to the millimeter you know suddenly taking this stuff apart was it was like hang on a minute this is a really <clears throat> different ball game and you learned a lot more about how buildings are put together by taking them apart. Yeah, the sure. demystification of it was, um, but it was very, very depressing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, no. Anyway, okay, I'm moving oh, on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are, um, yeah, no, I mean, it, yes, Maria's totally right. I think the, sort of the business plan idea about how the salvage has subsidize the design company so we started so started as architecture students started the salvage company and then started the design company why did we start the design company because we had a whole load of salvage that no one was buying off us because they, people said what do we do with this old rubbish so we said actually we can we can make your kitchen out of it or whatever and it started we started incredibly small i mean you know there are the graph of our of our growth has been you know a long very um low angles straight line um, Am I allowed to interrupt? No. no. <laughs> so I'm going to just run through a few other things and then Maria can take over. As she no, I don't, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> so, um, so this is uh, Heathrow Terminal 2, as was called. It started being that was the first terminal built in um, what was then called London Airport. So Frederick Gibbert um, designed it and built in, I think it was commissioned in 1955. And it, it was a celebration of, of Britain, so it had indigenous stone. So all the floor, of which I think it was about 2,000 square metres, was uh, Derbyshire fossil limestone. It's now quarried in incredibly small quantities, but at the time of our salvage, it actually, it wasn't being quarried at all. So it was a sort of unique material that I can't remember how many millions of people had walked over it, but it had the most beautiful patina. And we saved, I think it was 200 tonnes of stone. Um, and it was, you know, logistically quite a difficult project um but you know we managed to sort of do it you know it was, it was a huge kind of investment for us, but um sort of said we put in one stone mason and we managed to persuade the uh demolition subcontractor to take a big fat brown envelope um to enable it all because the baa weren't really interested in dealing with us so it's about getting to the guy on on the site um to enable it um 
and we managed to rehome all of that amazing, beautiful, beautiful stone. Um, this is the Cumberbatch building in Oxford, um, Trinity College. Um, this building lasted about 50 years. The Heathrow lasted 55 years. This building lasted 50 years. The reason I'm listing that is because I'm trying to make you aware that however much love you put into your design, you need to think about the next stage, how it's going to come apart, if it's going to come apart. It's a really depressing thought for someone setting out on a design idea that your stuff's about to be destroyed. Maybe not when I say about, I mean, it can be decades, but you know, the, the idea of the thousand year Reich that didn't quite materialize, right? So we're, uh, we're dealing with, you know, if we're going to talk about the subject, we've got to talk about reality. We've got to talk about how things go together and how they come apart. Um, you'll see- but, but it's exciting. I mean, I think the thing is to not make it sound too doom and gloomy. The idea that what you're creating now has got the potential of going somewhere else actually is not, you know, it's just a slight mind shift yeah. from how we've been taught to think. Maybe you're not you guys. You guys sound like you're on a very nice program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're teaching them how to imagine when it gets taken apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But we didn't get that at all. I mean, no. we weren't even allowed to consider even discussing the idea yeah. of, of anything green or reuse. We were literally thought of as like hippy dippy la la land. I mean, it was so not. Sorry. <laughs> Can I just interject? I think it's a really interesting point because many of us, I think we're yeah. of a certain age, as yeah. some of my colleagues are as well, we were taught in a sort of school of modern thought, which yeah. is about starting again, forgetting everything, and just yeah. keep on going. And, and I think that was the 20th century. Yeah. We're now well into the 21st, and I think that is reversing back out. And yeah. I like to think yeah. that our guys are getting a really good schooling in the fact that yeah. design isn't about just yeah. black slate, start again. Exactly. It's actually about thinking about any, any building. I mean, that's, well, obviously, any building in London that you're going to build requires demolition or strip out. Uh, and then in, in, our, in, in our decades of working this, the, the number of most of the sources of salvage are demolition. It's very, very rare, almost. <laughs> unheard of for us to be contacted by architects or interior designers who have bothered to think mm. we're stripping out this building would you like to salvage something mm. so whose responsibility is it to enable salvage it's always someone else's mm. um, but when you have a building you know that's, that's going to get redeveloped you know the building owner and the architect are probably discussing this you know a year two years three whatever months and months in advance and then the contracts go out and then the demolition contracts are awarded. That might be days or weeks before the work starts, maybe months, but you know, a short amount of time. So is it the responsibility of the demolition contractor who's only just got the job to research what's in there, do an audit, uh, contact people like me, work out how it's gonna get dismantled, work out the logistics and sell it on, or, was it the responsibility of the architect, interior designer, owner, building owner, property manager, whoever, who two, three years ago knew that this redundancy was happening and make it their responsibility to enable it? I'm going to leave that as an open question. I think I know the answer. Um, this is um, part of the Shell Centre in uh, near London Eye. That building lasted about 60 years. Some of it's still there, but about 60 years. All the window frames were teak, um, really big sections of teak. Um, and uh, the central mullion of those one, ones up in the top left um, are now the stair risers of, uh, of a built project you'll see in a bed. Um, it's incredibly, when you look, look at these um, uh, teak sections, you know, you've got to really kind of work out what you can save. And it, it's, it's very, very difficult sometimes to work out what you know how, physically how, how you can save it and what you can reuse it as but obviously anyway you're going to see much more of that later on yeah but, um, uh, but hang on but my images only um, are a bit more sorry to say you know they're a bit more on the sort of schwancy end of it you know they're kind of finished whereas well yeah that's more the that's, reality that's yeah that's but, the glamour of our world oh yeah <laughs> 
that is also what building sites are like. I mean, you know, there's a thing about it going into a magazine or seeing some beautiful finished thing online and people go, oh, you must have such love. And I'm not allowed to do anything. <laughs> it's it's very difficult. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you, you know, it's not, it's building sites. It's really unglamorous. It's normally freezing cold, invested in warm boots. That's yeah. all I can say. <laughs> so parquet with, with tar on the, on the back and dirty edges uh, to get reused has to be cleaned by hand. Um, hardwood, hardwoods are always something that, you know, we, you know, I saved the rainforest, you know, was a, obviously a sort of early ecological mantra. Um, so whenever I find uh, hardwood, and it's not all from rainforest, some of it's from, this is Eroka from West Africa, but, you know, it's still hardwood, tropical hardwood. Um, these are old uh, chemistry or you know, science lab worktops from, um, from schools and colleges uh, and we, we just got into a bit of a, um, uh, a channel of, of saving this wood and it became a bit, it's become a bit of a signature material for us. Can I go back to the Iroka? Yeah. Because there's also, I think one thing which you've got to be, well, I feel very conscious of is that when we first started using Iroko as a, whether it's Iroko or tea, you know, we were using it because it was like morally, you couldn't specify it and you, all of those things, which we all know, but also fashion, it was really unfashionable at that stage to be using dark hardwoods within, you know, within interiors. So it was about trying to show how you could make these things desirable again. So then it becomes quite successful because you've sort of shown how you can use it. People buy into that. You know, people get really excited. They buy it. Then you start realizing people are buying into this because they like the look of it. And then other people start specifying it without it being reclaimed. Get, get the look. So, you know, the whole sort of, so actually you start to feel kind of quite anxious about what you're, you know what you're doing because you know a lot of when stuff is so visually sexy you know you're just you know you're you know everyone's being sort of titillated left right and center but you're it's that thing of how and why should should something get reused so i don't know i get it's, um it's very yeah i mean just taking that point it, it's um in about 2008 um we started getting phone calls from it was just when Lehman Brothers went down, financial crisis, and suddenly our phone started ringing in a quite extraordinary way because we weren't really used to it ringing. The first decade was pretty much hitting our head against the brick wall as far as getting anyone to buy any of our stuff. And then suddenly um, our phone started ringing and just down the road from our warehouse, Westfield, uh, White City was being kitted out. And all these fashion companies were phoning us up going, uh, hey, yeah, we want reclaimed floor, we want reclaimed light fittings, furniture. And uh, Lehman Brothers were, you know, just gone down. Everything was like, you know, wobbling. And we were like, hey, what the hell's going on? And we realized that salvage brings that sense of longevity of history. And fashion companies were buying into it to show that they had a past and therefore they have a future. Um, it was a very interesting moment for us. Uh, also putting stuff into shop fits, which you knew was going to last like two years. Um, so it's kind of, you know, when things become fashionable, I get worried that when they're going to become unfashionable, because yeah, the sort of get the look kind of thing, you know, being Hugh started bringing out um, enamel style, vintage style, warehouse style lampshades. Ah. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it is it I mean, I don't know. Like, you know, we can't be. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, Crossrail happened i'm just trying to talk about like the city we're in about what where, what's being demolished crossrail um catalyzed a whole series of demolitions across the city um one of which was the university arts building by bond street tube station and the whole amount of copper light uh doors and windows which um again has become a little bit of a signature material for us and uh, we had we sold a lot of them but we were left with all these um windows which we loved anyway this is our shop front it's on harrow road one of the least glamorous roads in london uh but it was cheap real estate when we needed it and um 1016 harrow road if you want to come you're welcome 
Um, and so, yeah, that's now our shop front. You can see it being sort of all these windows knotted together. And um, I've got to say something about just nowadays, just with our whole understanding of energy, the whole energy crisis and whatever, these are obviously single glazed. So now we would never be really thinking about using that as an external skin. So most of the time when windows are coming out of buildings or whatever, they their, their reuse potential for us anyway, tend to be internally, which is actually fantastic. But um, yeah, it, each limitation is constantly shifting. Yeah. This, um, this is the same corner of our not very big shop warehouse. And just to show that we use the surfaces. So uh, left is the Heathrow stone. Then we've got uh, terrazzo column sections from Liverpool. Then we've got salvaged leather. So we, you know, we clad our, uh, you know, we create backdrops for our photography um, <coughs> using what the materials we said that will will uh, clad the wall and it'll be up for a year or two, and then move on to the next thing. So we, you know, we sort of because it's a great limitation. Limitation. Once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. You know, that's that's the fun. Um, the other another sort of salvage source that we've got into over the last years is uh, museums. So obviously, well, we're, we're right in South Kensington here. So you know, all the museums around the corner um, are constantly redoing their exhibits. So we've got some avid, some introductions, and and we were in a fortunate position to hoover up quite a few sort of old display material and old um, storage material uh, when it became redundant. It becomes redundant because it doesn't comply with security or environmental conditions or other display, you know, uh, um, other reasons. But so uh, a lot of museum cabinets have turned into kitchen islands or, um, you know, these kind of inventive reuses, which you'll see in future slides. Um, this is just to show some of the materiality. We're going towards a bit where I'm going to pass over to Maria. Um, okay. So this is just to show some of the materials that you've seen previously in a project. So um, Iroko doors that were salvaged and laid on their side to make other doors, uh, teak flooring, travertine, um, uh, the Derbyshire fossil stone, um, metal handrails. So just to start showing you our aesthetic, how, how do I get this? Okay, you want to start? Yeah, okay. No, no, but I don't want okay, to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is, um, this uh, Which door here mean? is the same door from the Cumberbatch building. That's, that, well, how do I go back? Oh, yeah. I don't want to go back. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, so this, I know we're meant to be talking about interiors, but the point that we, st when Adam was getting really anxious about things becoming the sort of the shop fit look, we thought, hell, we're going to have to sort of raise the game a little bit more, if only to sort of be educating ourselves, but also trying to prove that this stuff can also be done architecturally. So, um, and on the whole, we had done some other buildings, but we tend to attract some quite eccentric clients. I mean, that's the fun. We're, we're you know, we're really lucky in terms of who likes to work with us. They have very different ideas and attitudes and approaches um, but a lot of those new building bits that we've done had they had a sort of quirkier aesthetic which frankly the, the sort of traditional architectural world wouldn't take seriously and we thought we've got to show that you can use salvage materials in this kind of contemporary modernist way, default modernism. I mean, I'm a bit bored of default modernism, but, um, and I think it's... Yeah, when, when we started doing salvage, so, um, as far as anyone ever bought salvage, which, you know, didn't very much, is it was only for listed buildings or, you know, restoring old buildings, you know, a Victorian door went in a Victorian building, end of, you know, the idea of using salvage for something new was, sounds really daft now, but it was unheard of, you know. Yeah, anyway, so we decided to try and build this building where the all of the exterior skin here is all reclaimed materials. And, and on the whole, we've also experimented to see how they work when they're used internally and externally. So the tall 
pilasters, they're made from travertine. They're a single piece of travertine. And they had originally come from an Art Deco um, entrance hall. Um, the two columns that you can see, which are helping hold up the roof, they're handrails, which had been originally part of the v &A as handrails. Big sliding doors have been part of our children's um, primary school of a building that had been designed by BDP, so they had lasted a maximum of 15 years in situ. I mean, everything that you can see in that image is reclaimed bar the copper on the roof and a tiny bit of the railing. The railing, um, some of it had all come okay, from London School of Economics. Yeah, exactly. And then the cladding on the outside, this big sort of I mean, it looks like cool tent, but it's not at all. What is it? Oh. It's, it's, um, it was uh, the floor of a Belgian foundry. Yeah, it's got this very beautiful herringbone pattern on it. But the point was to remind us that, you know, if it's just bolted on, when we get bored of that, or if someone comes along and offers us a lot of fun for it, we can unbolt it and sell it to them. <laughs> and think about how we want to change it, because you want change. Well, I mean, not everyone wants change, but I like change in my life. Me less but, so. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but it's, how, do you, how do you make change? Anyways, so I'll wiggle on. And, oh, yeah, I'm look. controlling it. You're controlling it. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so inside here, this is sort of one of the spaces inside. So there, the walls have been lined with suede, which wasn't originally suede side out, was originally leather side out. So you can see one section down where the skirting is. Practical, very practical to Hoover and the mop. <laughs> Must think of these things. But the, the whole of those panels had originally come from Westminster Town Hall. And the colour, weirdly there, they're sort of tobacco-y, and because they're the suede side out, sorry for any vegans out there, um, they are unbelievably tactile and acoustically amazing. But we, Adam has had them in the warehouse for two, three years. Yeah, no one wanted to buy them. We had sold one panel, one panel, nobody wanted them. The moment that they were reversed this way around and became part of the interior, everybody loved one of them. So, um, Okay, and then the other with the floor, so the pattern isn't sort of gratuitous. It comes down to the fact that you're kind of working with existing size slabs, reclaimed different size slabs, and you've got the leftover teak, which was from the outside. So, ha you know, you're, what you're trying to do is help work with your contractor to minimize. They're the, the bit that they're going to hate you about because they're already going to find you a bit challenging turning up with all this salvage stuff. And then, you know, the timber has got nails in it, that's going to bugger up all their saws. They're really not going to like you for that. Then the stone, how much they can cut on site or not. I mean, it's the exact opposite of designing from, oh, I'm going to choose that, and it comes at 600 by 400. Anyway, so that was how the door came out. Um, and there's that door, yeah. And the sea <laughs> the ceiling in the space has um has been made with these wonderful wide pine cheese board sections, which Adam had shown earlier on um, near the Iroko. And the point about that was we'd worked on a boat, this very oops, very weird 19 um so the 70s actually was a super, it's one of the first super yachts, which sounds terrible, but God, it was the most exciting, most mm -hmm. reuse ever. And it was so good to learn about accessing services mm -hmm. to be able to arrange and allow for your future flexibility. So we sort of just did it in a very rough, crude way of just simply, I love, if you screw something, much easier to come out. Mm -hmm. So... There we go. Anyway, so very keen on the ceiling. And also sometimes you don't always want the bloody wood on the floor. You know, it can quite often be the priciest bit. We've got um, a lot of slides to get through in the oh, next sorry. 15 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. So this is this is limitation. Notting Hill, we're in the heart of Notting Hill here. We thought we'd give you a few plans. Uh, great plans. <laughs> oh God, I'm very fast. <laughs> okay, so on the left was the existing situation. Um, have you done any projects in sort of the slightly conventional 
or are you just doing really exciting things? <laughs> We've done them. You've done, oh, you have done them. Okay. So exactly. What's the problem in London? Lots of people want to put their kitchens on the lower ground floor because they like the idea of going out to the garden, and which is nice. I get it. Personally, I like to get up, get a bit of light. Anyway, here, if you're going on the whole, if you're going through a London house to get to the lower ground floor, you're actually going to be going by the service, servants access. It's not the kind of the route. So often we look at how and how simply we can create the, the right level of sort of grandeur movement, etc., to get through the space. So this was very simply closing up the original doorway so that this front living room could stay nice calm calm that's the word we use a lot calm and then you come across the space always being able to look into that room that room which because how often do people actually sit on their sofas not very often you know you're at the kitchen table all the time but very rarely in a sitting room well i don't know maybe you guys <laughs> and then we come back so there you go so we come across this space the columns introduced calmly so visually you can look in and then a new staircase that's popped down this was for a client who used to work in costume design and was kind of very well traveled and had you know her, pa her passion was textiles so the whole house has a very natural you know the what, what the other thing we were exploring other than the spatial was um literally the textiles that reflect a global kind of love and here is Adam. Wait, go back to your yeah, lovely was, mark. Where did you get that? Uh, that was uh, so. We have a lot of, um, as well as sort of stuff being salvaged, a lot of dead stock. So um, there was a stone yard that was sh shutting down, and a whole load of um, stone was about to go to the skip or whatever. Um, so we, you know, a lot of dead stock that that um, that, that we sort of find. Um, like we bought two tons of leather from a apple. So it's like salvage. You know, it's a very elastic. Um, so you know, sometimes you'll see stuff that has never been used, but it's still to us sort of you know putting stuff back into the into from, the market. Exactly, but also how you know it doesn't necessarily have to go into a shower room because it's marble, and this whole thing of actually showing the drill holes of how it comes out the slab. Yeah. It was just a block that was that. there, and, and we you know it's a Cipollino marble, and the client just just loved it. It had been cut, and we just we could just book match it. Um, like that. The art, because, oh, that's it. The big thing you've got to really remember with clients, most of them have terrible art. <laughs> 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 so you've got, <laughs> so, but it's true, so you've got to find ways of how you actually make the walls, you know, sing so they don't suddenly put up their picture hook with something, you know, <laughs> terrifying. Anyway, this, so this was the lower ground floor and um, the client, again, she spent a lot of time, her father had made um, cheese in Italy and she wanted to be reminded of a kind of rustic Italian vibe. So these are all the, old, the original um, floor joists, which were then insulated between, sanded up, and actually you can paint them so that they still work with fire rigs. Um, underfloor heating, lovely big sculptural stone fireplace. Which you wouldn't think that uh, that's in Notting Hill, would you? In our most liked picture on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, the, uh, the kitchen is made from an old floor, and that amazing oh, fairy. I'm not sure I like you being in control of <laughs> the, that. The wonderful sort of splashback. Um, oh my god, it's so beautiful. A bit of onyx. Oh my god, it's absolutely. And amazing. a bit of copper light coming in. So no. this disguises, this is the new stair that comes down, but it also hides the larder, the fridge, and all sorts of bits like that. This all sounds, and this, this is, is just very more tasteful. very tasteful, Adam, yes. Here are your cheese boards. Gosh, you're terrible. Stop flipping them. <laughs> the, um, here are the cheese boards upstairs making this wonderful, cosy little box bedroom, mm -hmm. um, which is... I don't know, it's one of the most heavenly places to try and sleep. 
but all that's all reclaimed in there with an amazing Tibetan textile that was used to make the um, blind and tiny. You know how a really sweet tiny little guest always comes to stay. Again, amazing textiles from Fez. Um, are there any? Do you actually want to ask any yeah, questions? Thanks. Oh, textiles, more textiles, Macedonia. This is a very different project for a client that we've worked with um, and have done quite a few collaborations and she's a completely different end of the spectrum from the sort of that sort of tactile textile world. So this is Bella Freud who we've done two or three. She's the daughter of Lucien Freud the painter and has a very definite sense of language and look and identity that we've kind of worked with her over the years. And we'd helped with her house, which was sort of just up here beforehand. And she'd always looked out onto the back of... Which I can show you on the next slide, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd looked out onto the very glamorous scene of corrugated asbestos roofs. Anyway, and then bought this site. So this became the site for her new house so it is completely landlocked it would have been the garden originally but it's obviously slowly over time just was a collection of sort of shanty huts um actually it was unbelievably romantic and sort of marvelous and you wish that there were still more places like this in london so i apologize but it's been judged up and um because it was landlocked you we could only get the whole space is lit from roof lights, which it, it's a, it's a old, it's a different, a whole different quality of light. And but at the same time, we wanted to make sure that there was constant visual connection and the sort of significance of windows and a sense of view and connection, so you didn't feel claustrophobic in any way. So these um, big windows were all salvaged from um, Battersea Power Station. And we use those within the courtyard. Yeah, this this whole the green area in a way becomes a bit like your sort of Roman central courtyard atrium. And you can see one, two, three, four windows that all look on to to that space. So there's this incredibly nice constant sense of connected. Um, anyway, and you can see this was about a couple of weeks after she moved in. Very relaxed at home um, and even in the kitchen these weird this weird um tall wall that we made sort of a bit like wallpaper but not because actually adam turned up with three bags of filthy curtains <laughs> absolutely <laughs> disgusting and you know you have to rip them apart give them a good wash and actually they're absolutely fantastic and the floor is a very good i mean these are actually old Viennese floor panels, parquet panels, but is an incredibly easy way to use up smaller leftover pieces of timber, um, which then can work quite well with the dress, you know, with underfloor heating, etc. A handsome sun. Um, this is the exit wall, you can see it's all sort of top lit. And this weird green silvery floor is a 19, originally 1940s wallpaper that we found somewhere. But it's also something quite nice about finding those pieces that don't feel like they've over been shop bought. And um, yeah, all the furniture is old, old. <laughs> There's that marvellous chair. If any of you have been to the National Gallery to see the Lucy in exhibition at the moment. Literally, that is the chair where some of those people are painted in. It's absolutely fantastic. And just in there to the left is his trolley. Was his painted trolley was just wrapped up in cling films. Everything's still there. It's very exciting. In fact, I think that might even be one of his plants. Um, here and then this is looking through into the bedroom. Um, Bella's very keen on carpet. Lots of issues about reuse with carpet. What can we have? Wool, jute. Does it come latex back? Preferably not. Can it be compostable? All of those sorts of things. Actually, weirdly, this stuff is pretty blinking resilient. Um, 
Where did you salvage those from, Ed? Um, I think they're from Liverpool, from the same place as the columns. Anyway, they're it's the a, most uh, amazing. Burr maple. Yeah, book match <coughs> burr maple, which we you know we just added a bit too to make the height in our dressing room. Um, and this is the bathroom, which is the same stone, the Cipollino stone. And this was, there was a salvage yard, I think they're called English Salvage. And um, they happened to have this on their site for years. Again, no one interested in it whatsoever. And it's just the most fantastic, anyway, weird, marvellous, um, it's a kind of 70s interpretation of an Art Deco um, entrance hall, which had yeah, come from the from, Unilever building, yes. Blackfriars. Exactly. And then the consoles and mirror originally had been joined together and, you know, very shallow consoles. So we just extended them and made them into the basin. And then the mirrors now house all the sort of practical gubbins <laughs> behind. So on the whole, everything, everything in there is salvaged, bar the tap fittings, because we've done tap fittings in the past, but that now with, you know, microbore, different size pressure, et cetera, it's not quite clear. Yeah. Come back on that one last slide. Yeah. On the right hand side, I mean, that's a beautiful image. What? Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, just, yeah. I'm fascinated by your kind of process. To what do you ascribe your kind of process? Are you, are you setting out with a design identity in mind or is it purely reliant on the material that comes to you? And... Well, a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think what we tend to do with clients is um, literally see what they respond to as materials mm -hmm. and or if they're excited by them so we will quite often so i prefer to play around with things at that one-to-one -one scale mm -hmm. so if we see something interesting in someone else's salvage site or whatever we'll quite often buy a meter or whatever of it so we've just physically got it there mm -hmm. so we understand what its kind of thickness is what its problems are and see how it works and then see how clients might respond to it the the unilever mirrors have actually, like everything, it's, there's a finite quantity. But actually, it's amazing how far you can make a finite quantity <laughs> spread. So they, they, for about three years, they probably appeared in quite a few different projects to lesser, lesser or whatever, greater degree. Um, and I think here with Bella, it was just, I think we wanted something really strong and confident so she was kind of up for the quantity <coughs> of it um it's not that you know traditionally we might draw a drawing or a model yeah. or something and show it to somebody but i love the idea that you know <coughs> taking stuff and going what do you think of that against yeah. that so on and so forth. i find it easier i mean literally if i was asked to design something from scratch i find that really frightening because mm -hmm. it's like i mean the world of drawing you don't know you know, so limitations, I think, are a brilliant thing. And and also, you're physically showing to the client, and they've seen it. It's not like you're doing a drawing and then it's going off and you've got to wait six months for it to be, you know, it's been shipped back from the other side of the world. I mean, you know, and on the whole, it's quite good value, but quite high. It's very, I mean, it's very interesting during, um, you know, COVID times, lockdowns, and uh, the breakdown of international supply chains to actually salvage became more of use because it's here now and you know we don't have to wait for it to come and, you know you couldn't order it so actually it's, it's time sort of came i was going to ask you about that as well in, in light of where we are now with supply chains and stuff like that and the mm -hmm. rising price of materials have yeah. you noticed that that's impacting upon your work as well? yeah I mean, it's quite um <clears throat> it's quite tempting to raise the price of everything on, on our website but um Try, try not to do that too much, but um, so no, you, you said you know you have to be realistic about selling things within. You know, you have to sort of keep an eye on the context. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in so the, so you know, in a way, salvage is parasitic. So actually, as things fail, you gain. Yeah. Start, I mean, you know what I mean. It's that cycle. Yeah. So yeah. it's not. I mean, that, that's what I used to find really difficult about the demolition sites at the beginning. I found it very um, destructive and, yes, as I said, parasitic. 
Mm-hmm. Whereas Adam felt excited because he felt like he was saving something. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was destroying something. Mm-hmm. And um, but actually, yeah, the sort of Maria, before we go on to your oh, house, yeah. we open it up to QA because I think we've we uh, run out of time. No, 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 but I think it's just that now is quite a good time, otherwise. I mean, this project is, well, we can't even, do you want to do this one quickly? I can do this, I'll do it quickly, I promise, I promise I'll do it quickly. Okay, this, the images here is more just as a reminder to ourselves that even if you're doing interiors, every, any little patch that you have got where you can green has a massive, massive impact. And it is so beneficial to everybody from the rainwater runoff that we're having through to insect life, wildlife, you know, I mean, and for your soul. So any opportunity where you can actually get in a bit of uh, growth uh, is, oh, you'll be you'll be blessed, they'll love you for it. Um, this is actually our home and um, where Adam was originally brought up a long time ago in the 1970s, and it was originally built by his father, but pre-oil crisis, and so there was no insulation and no, not really much heating, and anyway, it was fabulous, but we needed to, uh, we couldn't live in central London burning fossil fuels to stay warm. Um, so we did a sort of refurbishment on it, and but you can see, but well, I like wild, <coughs> like wild, wild, wild. Um, the patique that's being used, um, you know, a reminder of what happens with inherited pieces. You know, where you will all that will be something you'll have to tackle at some point in your life, and how do you incorporate that? I'm very keen on textiles as well for age. So here are those, um, uh, these are terrazzo, and they came from this department. Uh, they, came, they came from Liverpool, from a, yeah. Yeah, from, um, yeah, a department store called Lewis's, and we bought, I think, 1,100 pieces, which was a 40-foot trailer, I think about 28 tonnes or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, we had a, it was Maria's idea to take, they were, you know, four of them formed a circle. They were clouding around at RS uh, you know, steel column. Um, and Maria had the idea to sort of open up as a small surface. And uh, so, yeah, for about two or three years, every project, not every project, but a lot of projects had this, but, you know, that then while the finite quantity um, and, uh, yeah, they, they were fantastic. Yeah, they're, they're actually disguising um, the main chimney stack that goes through the building. Tapestries, very keen on tapestries. This is the Iroco, that profile that you see on the right is um, the, the Iroco laptops that have just been machined to make a uh, to make the kitchen. Um, and these are the doors which originally held the textile collection from the B&A. Um, and, but it's just a reminder of, um, you know, make them as pieces of furniture because then they can just very simply come off the wall when you are bored of them or need a change or want to use them elsewhere or you're moving. Um, I just want to <laughs> just talk about this particular um, timber. So our flat, when we refurbished it, the point was it's so hard being your own client, but in a way what we did was we just decided to choose elements from other projects that we'd already done and uh, almost have an example of it for us to see how it aged. Um, so this this big joinery piece is actually made from um, old shelves that had been um, reclaimed from the patent office. And the shelves were, you know, only about this size. And the back edge was made out of tulip wood. Um, and the front edge had a uh, lip in oak. And with our joiner, when we cut it through, you know, if we got two pieces out of one, um, we just realised we'd get this rather fabulous, weird pattern. So that's serendipity. We would never, I would never have designed that like that from scratch. Um, and we're now doing another project using the same materials, but you know, in a completely different um, pattern. 
Uh, yeah. Okay, so do Q and A. Yeah, yeah, Q and A. Q and A. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do the materials speak to you in that way? You described the timber suggesting a pattern to you and so on. Do you find that often that some of the material will tell you a way of arranging it or sorting it? Uh, well, my team, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> we spend a lot of time laying, well, either lay this things out. This is on the team now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we'll do is, uh, They'll get frustrated with me as I say, let's try another pattern or whatever. So what will happen is there will be, you know, most things will be digitally then worked out to sort of see and explore the variations. So anything, especially with anything that's like a parquet size piece. But the, um, the, the design team and the, and the, and the, sal the salvage shop are extremely physically close to each other. So you can, you know, yeah. there's a very close <laughs> yeah, ask you about that. yeah you relationship to each other all the time yeah exactly i mean i think you know to state the obvious it would be impossible yeah Maria's project wouldn't look you know the the the, the, the cross fertilization between the two mm. activities is you know obviously our sort of usp mm. so i think it's it's really amazing to be able to access and work with those materials mm. so directly and just logistic i'm sorry i'm not going to hold all the questions <laughs> because i'm sure there's loads online but just logistically yeah. You must be dealing all the time with trucks going out. Yeah. Or is that, is yeah. That yeah our case? neighbors love us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, we've got. Yeah, we've got. Um, it's not that bad. No, it's yeah. We've got. We've got kind of. I suppose about ten thousand square feet in total, um, and we've got some other storage in Park Royal, and we've got something else in Gloucestershire. So yeah, there, there is always a sort of you know every day. Yes, we've got you know we've got a warehouse team of of, of people who do the physical work. But our clients, um, we make our clients take a container. And so that as you know, as the projects develop, you know, we're buying it, setting aside, mm. it goes into a store, so it's there for them, ready. Gotcha. So it also with the idea that if they don't use it, we can use it on another mm. project. But the, what happens is you can you don't want them to lose something because someone else is sort of nipped along the way. Yeah. So you've got to allow a bit of flexibility while you're developing up what that whole kind of aesthetic and you know which way the project's going to go. Um, and ideally always factor in a little bit more. I mean basically you guys should all have your own little salvage. Yeah. It, I mean, it's seriously, seriously good because also Adam was completely right at the beginning. The salvage side subsidized the design. Yeah. But the that thing was, about salvage is also it's it's no tech. It's not low tech, it's no tech. I mean just how did you start doing it? We just started by doing it, you know, pulling things out of skips, you know, it's sort of like, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, you can all like, you know, theoretically, you can all do it, just like get a bit of storage, get a lock up, get a spare bedroom, get a, you know, whatever you can, and you can start putting things aside and it will, you know, enhance your. And ours really, you know. really, really did start in the spare bedroom. I yeah. mean, it really did. It, we absolutely structurally probably totally overloaded <laughs> one room to the point of being yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everything from huge doors cast iron fireplaces yeah. tiles door yeah. handles whatever it makes you very fit as well so <laughs> <laughs> another question we're going to prioritize questions from the audience from the students um and we're also going to um uh, resume as well um, <laughs> Oh. I've got a microphone. Um, this is actually on exactly what you were just saying. You've just said that we should all be doing this ourselves. But I wanted to add, like, and you and you touched on the fact that you were doing this before. We were talking about like a climate crisis and things like that. And do you do you feel any sort of like in, internal tension with that, like with the idea that you you sort of want to tell everyone go and do this so we'll save the world that we're all building like this but then actually it's it's your business idea and you've no 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 it. you've got yeah. to do it there is so yeah. much stuff seriously no. we're, yeah we're very unpossessive yeah. i mean it, the amount of stuff that gets i mean as stephanie said in the end of the yeah. introduction one percent approximately of sal of material gets salvaged mm. and damaged like, you know we can double treble quadruple ten times that and yeah. you know i would absolutely if, you know if 
if my legacy was was to go out of business because there was so much competition, I would be die happy. I tell you. So you'd love it if like Mace and Arab stepped mm -hmm. in and, and took all of your ideas and and just well, you know, if, if, all a massive if, scale. If, if, you know, if, if if they was if they started saving stuff, I mean, I was having a conversation with Derwin London uh, later <coughs> there the other other day, and I said like, I was we were talking about some doors, anyway, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, I said like you know that I went to ask one of your sites, you didn't save anything from a certain building on Baker Street. And anyway, whatever, that was a conversation. But, you know, if those big developers started reprogramming the way they demolish buildings, decommission buildings, you know, that's, yeah. for me, a success, yes. not yes, failure. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, I mean, I, but really seriously, do, because also how you're going to use something that you save or the thing that you're going to save or rescue or whatever is different and that's so in a way how you're going to reuse it and offer it to your clients or whatever that's that's really exciting but it doesn't it's you know it's not just the idea is to just actually that was the only reason that the design business started was to try and show and also try and understand ourselves actually how difficult it is to reuse stuff because it is i mean there are um, um Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hello. Um, thank you for that. So, just a question. Obviously, all the materials that you use come with tons of texture and detail. How, how do you know when a space has had enough? Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably I don't. <laughs> no. Uh, I th a, a lot of it depends on the clients because you're actually designing for them and it's so so yeah you are an editor as well you know you have to work out how much they can should have I mean that's what your role is as a designer it's very tempting to turn everything into a junk shop which is you know why Maria's the designer not me because that's what I actually I would like to do <laughs> but um yeah, no, it's, it's, it's so, yeah, it's, when you've got so much sort of, on, you know, a lot of clients go, oh, can we have that and that and that and that? And, you know, it's sort of quite hard to sort of pull them back to actually, no, you can't have it. It's too much. But I think that's why I wanted to show you this, some two of those projects, which are so different in their aesthetic and in their approach, because that's actually what you have to do as a design. You know, it's not really what you want. It's mm -hmm. what they, you know, that's... <laughs> <clears throat> I think, but you know, other designers are more it's sort of editing maximalism. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm Alicia, and love your presentation, by the way. So, um, I'm kind of interested in trying to understand, like, the kind of struggle that you have with the quality of materials and how you transform the salvaged materials into something that can look so aesthetically perfect like what, with different different materials what is the struggle that you go through that's a brilliant question because we're not doing it it's your tradesmen and you've got to love them and you've got to woo and cajole them and to begin with they will hate you because they will see something that they think is it. but actually i've we found over the years that no, they're so bored of being given, you MGF. know, yeah, I mean, they're so, bored. so actually when they're helping bring something back to life, they take huge pride in it and, and then they're much more invested in it. And that is so nice. I think so generally like, the materials we try to salvage are the ones that have, you know, a quality to them, you know, sort of tropical hardwoods, you know, all the things we've talked about. I mean, they are superior quality timbers to something you'd buy on the high street um so it's just a case of you know bringing them back you know working working with well, them it's also about working out where it's appropriate you know working out where it's appropriate to use it so if something's a veneer you know you're probably not going to put it on the floor because it's only got two millimeters of wood left before it gets worn out um but it really is the um yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also, I mean, it's, it's, uh, the edge of your question is about liability and like you know, most of our projects are residential. I mean, you know, this when you get into um, big litigious commercial projects, no, salvage no. becomes even more difficult than it already is because people say, have you got a certificate for that? And we go, no, 
and you know, how does that conversation go with the? I think it has uh, actually moved on. It's moved on like, a bit. It, it has, really... A lot of it will depend on the fire officer or the building control, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, it depends where it is. I mean, but but you know, small Marais well with mine. I think actually, I think it is amazing how much that has moved on. That was a big problem for a while. Um, you know, and the way you had to get round it was you had to get the client to be the person who bought it, and so it became client supply contractor fit, or you would have a nominated subcontractor to help fit it. But um, yeah, I mean, we we majorly rely on some brilliant Polish builders and some other great contractors. And, yeah, and you know, you take them on the journey with you, so. They need to, yeah, they're invested in it as well, but they uh, do take risks. We have time for three more questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you for that. Um, I was actually going to ask, yeah, following up on the point you just raised about um, working on larger scale commercial projects, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the experience you've had on slightly larger scale projects and how your very kind of bespoke approach might apply, some of those principles might um, be projected onto a larger scale project. Uh, well, I think on the, well, as Adam says, 90% of what we do is residential. And even on the ones that are being commercial, they are almost like doing big residential because they're privately funded. Um, so there, and therefore those people are totally prepared to take risks on what they, you know, on something that they want. Um, I think it's about, I suppose it depends what it is. But there'll be it's all about the area in which you're proposing to reuse it so if it's going to become a statement piece that's going to reflect well on them you know the dreaded foyer then um that you know then you you can probably sell them anything in terms of the idea of something and they'll kind of go for it i mean i would say most builders and most contractors really are up for working around working with you it's about having the dialogue with them and just you know start and being really honest i think what anyone hates is when someone comes along and pretends that they know what they're talking about and they don't because <laughs> well, that's not going to, no one wins in that situation so it's so much easier to say i've got this idea i think it could look but how are we going to build it you know, then they're invested with you, or you know. Anyway, that's um, sorry, it's swear. Potty mouth. I have another one question. Um, in this beautiful way of working, do you think the process of creation and the process of execution is taking longer rather than a normal project? The process of execution and the creation and the creation. The creation is quick. I mean, in terms of because they've literally physically got the thing there to see, so that um, I don't think it's allowed to be. I mean, you're always working to, to time scales. You work, you do what you need to no, do to achieve no, the no. time scale. But the builder will say the the execution can definitely take a bit longer, can't it? Oops. The execution. <laughs> I think it can, but but it depends on who you're with. It's, it's sort of like finding the right person to do the right bit. So like we've got one person who is just as literally is not terrified about being given a whole pile of really raggedy broken stone and he will turn it into a sort of gem. Mm -hmm. So it's if you find the right person to do it, it what's, when it becomes a disaster and we've had plenty of those along the way is when they say, yeah, that's all right, I've got the nice stone, I've got stone next No accents. Sorry, no accents. <laughs> I've got my stone and the stonemason come and they've never laid a reclaimed floor before and they're cross and frustrated and whatever with it. So I think it's, yeah. And try it out. It's all that thing of literally yourself physically trying, you know, what the finish is. You know, is it going to have the, what sealant is it going to have? That's always the thing that clients get traumatized by. That transformation when you show them a beautiful bit of timber and they go, oh, look at that walnut. I've always loved walnut. We had a walnut tree in our garden at home, blah, 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 whatever it was. And then suddenly you show them walnut with a sealant on it because, and then they go, 
um, anyway. So that's so just definitely make sure that that question. My question was um, just your direct dial with to the demolishers and things. How that how that operates? Are you literally on on call all the yeah, time? Yeah, I'm connected? very reactive. Um, I'm very reactive. I never quite know what today is going to bring. Um, and my world is um, really random. It and um, I wish it was my you know it, it could, if I was a more organised person it it could be more you know I could follow planning applications and be quite rigorous but the reality is that my phone hopefully rings and it's just and I and I get pulled and I, so most so, of the time it is people coming to you thinking oh we've got yeah I mean it, it's yeah. really you know it happens in every different way so like sometimes I'm going cycling down the street and I see a skip yeah. and I think what's going on and another <laughs> time you know it's a phone call I go to antiques fairs talk to other people in the trade a lot of stuff gets run to me from the trade um I the only thing I never do is auctions because I don't like com competition. Um, um, so I tend to get a lot from runners, a lot from um, direct from source, and then a lot from kind of institutions. Um, That's what we were sort of collectively interested in the institute. The, the things that you're taking out of demolition, are you finding things are easy to take apart? I mean, you've shown us parquet and... Um, or is it so getting, are they getting easier? So I, I used to do a lot more site work. Where they, you know, over the the decades, um, the uh, health and safety aspects of salvage have got much more onerous, much more difficult. Um, so you used to be able to go onto a site wearing trade trainers and you know oh, yeah. whatever. Now you've got to be inducted for three days and all this kind of thing. Yeah. And it's quite frankly a nightmare. So I don't, I tend to work more through the contractor rather than, you know, so it, it, it happens in a lot of different ways and there's no, there's, you know, there's no one kind of way. But um, so I, you know, if I get, I, I'll tend, what I try to encourage the demolition guys to do is call me on day one and I'll walk around and I'll do a sort of informal audit. You know, that's worth saving, that's worth saving. Okay. And then yeah. if it's something incredibly delicate, I will um, maybe get permission to go on site with my team and I maybe I'll employ a specialized, you know, stonemason or whatever. But normally I will just handhold their laborer or laborers to try and educate them. And this is how I want it done. Um, but you know, it's a really, 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 really informal world that I inhabit, and it's, it, it can happen in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. yeah, they can notice some things are designed for disassembly more often yeah. now, and they're more because they're not going through yet. Sorry, it doesn't happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even like, I don't know, I mean, I've got so many things I could talk about, but like okay. the Millennium Dome exhibition that was designed mm -hmm. to be there for nine months. And I went there and you had a JCB like that going through the stuff. And I mean, you're like, Jesus Christ, you were designing it for nine months. You didn't think yeah. to, um, to design it to be unscrewed. And, you know, so it is, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's a crazy world out there. It's really depressing. Is it a lot of used envelopes with crumpled files? No, I can't say that online. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's an informal world, I don't have it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, but your brain must be going to probably the fibers for that. Yeah, but, you know, that needs to be a tenor. What you're often paying for is the service of dismantling it rather than the value of the item. Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, you want to educate them enough to save it, not educate them so much that they... Themselves. Themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, just counteracting what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we have to give the auditorium back and everything, but thank you so much for um, coming. Thank you for having us. <laughs>